This morning, the subcommittee will examine the HUD Inspector General's review of the Housing Authority of the City of Passaic, New Jersey, as a starting point for hearings on abuses and mismanagement in the use of funds from the Comprehensive Improvement Assistance Program and other federal programs by public housing authorities. When the subcommittee last looked at a HUD project in New Jersey, we focused on how politically well-connected consultants were able to force an unwanted moderate rehabilitation project, Seabrook Apartments, on the rural town of Upper Deerfield and to turn a HUD-subsidized housing program into a money machine. As we move from the southwest to the northeast of New Jersey and from the farmlands of Upper Deerfield to the urban center of Passaic, we find that one does not have to be in an agrarian setting to milk a hot program. <laughs> Today we will try to untangle what I've chosen to call the Passaic puzzle. How did the executive director of the Passaic Housing Authority, Mr. Paul Margulio, find enough hours in the day to perform two full-time jobs and two part-time jobs with salaries almost entirely paid from HUD funds and still have enough time left over to earn $47,115 for time and a half compensatory time pay? In addition to being full-time executive director, secretary of the Housing Authority of the City of Passaic, Inspector General's audit shows that Mr. Paul Margulio held a full-time job of modernization director, the part-time job of contracting officer, and the part-time job of purchasing agent. According to the IG report, the full workday in Passaic is budgeted at six and a half hours, which strikes me as a rather short workday. But even accepting the six and a half hour workday as a full workday, Margulia would have had to work 17 hours and 20 minutes a day to perform all of his duties, not counting uncompensated time for meals. Mr. Margulio had really been able to work that much, this subcommittee might not begrudge the executive director, modernization director, contracting officer, purchasing agent, the unauthorized bonus his housing authorities board of commissioners paid him in the form of a $10,000 payment for the premium of an annuity policy. We probably wouldn't have kept quibbled over his PHA credit card, his annual expense allowance of $7,500, and his generous travel allowance, if they had been documented. But when the Inspector General's report tells us that in 1988 alone, Mr. Paul Margulio was paid $245,956, $245,956, not counting his bonus. Considerably more than the 84,185 HUD approved salary, our credulity is sorely tried. But the Passaic puzzle is even more complicated. There were many other irregularities in compensation. For example, the Deputy Executive Director, Mr. Donald Pieri, also held another full-time job as a modernization specialist and another part-time job as public agency compliance officer, leading to payment in 1988 of $106,868 instead of the budgeted $57,970. Paul Margulio's wife, Louise, who was the PHA Director of Administration, was paid more than $95,000 between January 1986 and her retirement in April 1988 after working only one day. One day. 
$50,000 of her disability pay was found by the Inspector General's audit to be improper. The Passaic Housing Authority procured legal services without competitive negotiation or without any documentation and despite HUD regulations requiring written approval before paying any lawyer over $10,000, Attorney August Michaelis was paid $270,840 in contracts over that amount that were never approved or open to competitive negotiation. All of this and much more such as the disposition of five almost new automobiles for one dollar each was approved by the Public Housing Authority Board of Commissioners. As a result of this avalanche of abuses, Secretary Kemp took the unprecedented action of seeking to take over the Passaic Housing Authority and suspended five employees, including the two top administrators and two consultants. I applaud and commend the Secretary's swift action, which is a welcome departure from our experience under the Pierce administration. A federal district judge will hear a challenge to his action on Thursday when the former officials <coughs> seek a temporary restraining order. While we will hear from HUD officials today on the Passaic audit, we wanted to give the former Passaic officials an opportunity to present their side of the story. But in light of pending legal action, some of them have asked for additional time to prepare and we have granted that additional time. The authorities chairman, Mr. Peter Morocco, attorney August Michaelis and Vice Chairman William Scruggs have indicated their willingness to appear in the near future. Mr. and Mrs. Margulio were asked to appear today, but their attorney declined our invitation because of their involvement in the court hearing on Thursday. We have asked them to agree on a voluntary basis to appear at our next hearing on this matter. Should they refuse, I will ask the subcommittee to issue subpoenas for their appearance. Although public housing in Passaic has received the initial attention of the HUD investigators, it is not the only New Jersey city in which there appears to have been gross misuse of federal funds. In Perth Amboy, there have been allegations that the former director of the Public Housing Authority called contractors to perform emergency work on the public housing project at least 326 times between March 1984 and September 1985 at a cost of $1,050,000, a rate of over $200,000 per year. The extent to which this was a costly abuse of procedures that were to be used only for unforeseen emergencies can be seen from the fact that the larger Jersey City Housing Authority has had only three emergencies in the past three years, costing about $58,000, or about $20,000 per year, one-tenth the Perth Amboy rate. No one begrudges paying the bill for real emergencies, but every homeowner knows that you can save costly repairs with a little preventive maintenance. But apparently, Perth Amboy preferred to call the repairman to patch up problems and pay him primarily from federal comprehensive improvement assistance program funds that were supposed to have been used for providing new kitchens, new bathrooms, and other facilities for the tenants. One would suspect that following the emergency repair route was preferred because competitive bidding rules could be bypassed. Newspaper reports indicate that nearly half of the funds, $496,392.12, went to one plumbing and heating contractor who was called 124 times 
in the period discussed. In addition to learning more about how the Passaic Housing Authority went out of control, we will want to learn from our witnesses if they believe this situation to be an aberration or a national problem, and what can be done to prevent future Passaics. Congressman Lukens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like, first of all, to compliment and join the chairman in doing so, the IG, on conducting a timely and accurate investigation of the Passaic New Jersey Public Housing Authority. I know that the committee will have continuing interest in er other areas of New Jersey, as well as the states of Michigan, specifically the city of Detroit, <coughs> Illinois, the city of Chicago, and in California, several uh, public housing areas there. The problem of malfeasance and mismanagement just continues to grow, it seems, uh, the closer we look at the whole thing. Some PH employees, as the chairman has mentioned, have received more than one salary. Uh, we know this uh, exemplifies the real need for on-hand supervision, which apparently just lacking in every area, even though required in the 1982 Financial Integrity Act. We also need to carefully examine the system of appointing members to the Board of Commissioners for these public housing agencies. I think that's one thing that we've really not focused on, and certainly the, new, the news coverage and new information uh, developed by committee staff and investigators points in this direction. With these concerns, I joined the chairman calling for a, a reopening, really, in many ways, and a hard look at what we know to be an agency that's been troubled by just simply poor management and a very little supervision, if at all. So I join with the chairman and other members of the committee in looking forward to what new information these hearings can develop. Thank you very much, Mr. Lukens. Congressman Martinez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd simply like to say that uh, I agree with Mr. Lukens uh, as to the need for uh, the information we are bound to discover in these hearings. But, you know, it, it seems to me that there's a couple of things other that ought to be said. And I can't understand the arrogance of these people uh, after they've been discovered to be committing waste abuse and fraud, something that in the last administration their thrust was to eliminate and seems like if at least in this particular situation they uh, did not eliminate it but they perpetuated it and enlarged it. But the arrogance of the individuals to challenge the action of Secretary Kemp is really boggle, boggles the mind. You know most normal people after committing such what I consider to be a real crime would have crawled into a hole and tried to pull it in over the cover in over them. But not these people. They're going to challenge the action of uh, Secretary Kim. I think that's appalling. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Congressman Shays. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It appears that the actions of some officials at the Passaic Housing Authority have made the activity of people like James Watt, frankly, look like child's play. Uh, I'm certain that uh, we could practically look at any local housing authority and find fertile ground for our investigation, whereas last year may have been the year of uh, focus on HUD Central. I hope this committee uh, begins a very concerted effort to look at housing authorities throughout the country, uh, because I think we will find the same mismanagement, the same fraud, the same general ripoff that we've seen uh, in Washington. I just want to go on record, Mr. Chairman, as saluting my colleague on the right, uh, saluting you and this committee and uh, Charles Schumer and others who uh, uh, not only participated in this, these hearings but made sure that we would see reforms with the passage of H.R. 1, uh, 1989, uh, the Public Act 101-235 that was signed by the President on December 15th. Uh, we not only looked at HUD and, um, and exposed wrongdoing, but we didn't stop there. We w all worked together, together, Republicans and Democrats, uh, Congress and the White House, to move forward with some major reforms. And so I just, uh, I feel that uh, we can expect the same good work this year as well. Well, before I call on my next colleague, let me just say that no member of this committee has done more to uh, unearth uh, the shenanigans than gentlemen from Connecticut. Uh, we are delighted today to welcome uh, two colleagues who are not members of the committee. Uh, we hope they'll be able to be with us uh, for this entire hearing and future hearings. I'm 
very pleased to introduce my friend and colleague from New Jersey, Congressman Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I'd like to commend you for the outstanding job you've been doing as it relates to public housing in this country, because it's an extremely important area. Secondly, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to participate today in this hearing. Although a member of the Government Operations Committee, I'm not a member of your subcommittee, and I appreciate your thoughtfulness. I have a particular interest uh, in this situation, although it's not in my congressional district. It borders on my district, but for a number of years during my early career, I served as a public school teacher in Newark, but then secondly in Passaic, New Jersey. And my students came from the two public housing developments in the city of Passaic. I've been to Passaic during uh, Martin Luther King's birthday and will be there during Black History Month and speaking at Pulaski School where I taught in a week or so from now. And so I have many people who I know personally who grew up in public housing and people who have uh, exhibited and have talked about the problems of this housing authority. So for that reason, I really thank you for allowing me to be here. I, uh, we all know that public housing authorities were established out of a need to provide homes for low-income families. Today, when we are faced with a national crisis due to the severe lack of affordable housing, there is no place for abuses such as these alleged here. In my own state of New Jersey, housing prices increased 46 percent compared to the national average of about 21 percent between 1980 and 1985. Nationally, housing programs were cut by more than 70 percent over an eight-year period during the Reagan administration. We must take every effort to protect the spending and management of public housing, which were meant to provide a basic need uh, necessity for uh, low-income people. Again, once again, I appreciate the opportun opportunity to be here today, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Congressman Payne. <coughs> Chair is delighted to welcome his uh, friend, colleague, and neighbor, uh, Congressman, Congresswoman Rukema, who uh, was so helpful and uh, effective in uh, earlier hearings that we had, although not a member of this subcommittee. She is the ranking uh, Republican on the housing uh, subcommittee, and we hope she'll uh, be with us uh, many times during the spring. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I certainly want to once again express my sincere appreciation for the fact that you are again extending the hospitality of this subcommittee in your graciousness, uh, in your gracious manner, I should say, uh, to members of the housing uh, subcommittee. As you know, the findings and recommendations of your subcommittee must be implemented, and as was done uh, in the reform legislation passed in, the, in this Congress, uh, as alluded to by Congressman Shays, in response to the disclosures of your subcommittee's hearings with respect to uh, the HUD scandals as they reach the headlines across the, paper, the, the nation. I would like to again commend the leadership of the distinguished gentleman from California, and I think everyone will agree that Chairman Lantos has performed with a high degree of thoroughness and fairness and in a statesmanlike manner. And for this, we are all in his debt. And I think it's the reason that we were able to conclude a reform measure quickly in a bipartisan way because of your leadership. Mr. Chairman, we are here now together uh, with so soon with another outrageous and shocking abuse of the public trust, and this time in Passaic, New Jersey. Uh, to quote um, Undersecretary Alfred Del Bovi in recent news accounts, it was a public be damned attitude and a pillaging of the public trust, and I don't think Undersecretary Del Bovi has exaggerated. To the credit of the Inspector General's office, a routine uh, audit for a CAP, which is a modernization program, was broadened to review portions of the Section 8 low rent housing and Section 23 programs. The result of this review was a shocking tangle of irresponsibility and outright corruption, as the chairman has already outlined. Grossly excessive salaries, multiple job titles, abuse of taxpayer-funded credit cards, travel, and leave time. Nothing was left untouched. We are here this morning to begin the process of determining if this sordid case of Passaic Housing Authority 
was a single example, an extreme, not to be duplicated any other way, any other place, or whether it was a case of gross corruption and misconduct, not merely an example, but part of a larger systemic problem across the nation. Many of you are, have read or heard about the letter that I sent last month to Secretary Kemp regarding the formation of the strike force to investigate potential financial irregularities of public housing authorities across the state of New Jersey. Let me state again unequivocally, as I did in my letter, that I applaud Secretary Kemp's aggressive response to, to the disgraceful episode <coughs> regarding Passaic housing, including the suspension of the senior PHA officials and the eventual, eventual takeover of the authorities' operations. However, I also recommended in that letter, written to Mr. Kemp, that he explore the efficacy of moving beyond the borders of New Jersey to launch a series of spot checks of public housing authorities across the country. My aim was not to divert attention from New Jersey. My aim was to broaden the target of the strike force beyond New Jersey. Mr. Chairman, I noted, uh, just as an aside, that you uh, singled out New Jersey, and I know you didn't mean to in your opening statement uh, regarding, uh, what was it, Deerfield, from the fields of Deerfield to the city of Passaic. I know you didn't mean to single it out, and I would hope that you would agree that it's evidence that there is, well, as a battle-scarred veteran of the savings and loan wars, I will say that one thing we learned was that if there's smoke, there's fire, and I certainly think that the smoke that we've seen here is reason to look further to see if there is an underground fire here, lest the taxpayer get very burned. Mr. Chairman, I believe we need spot checks. We need aggressive action by the IG's office. We need more penetrating examination of lo local housing authority management. Even though HUD's so-called decontrol policy, which we may go into a little further here, apparently did not specifically trigger uh, this scandal in Passaic, I do think we need a thorough examination of this policy as well as the line of command that extends beyond just the New Jersey cases. But first, we must hear from these witnesses today, and I thank them for being here, and I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your leadership. Well, thank you very much, Congressman Rukema. Let me just make a couple of observations. First of all, I want to thank you for your most gracious comments, and uh, let me thank publicly all of my Republican and Democratic colleagues for superb bipartisan cooperation, which I know we will have during the course of the spring. Uh, secondly, let me assure you that we happen to be dealing with New Jersey, but we are not singling out New Jersey. and uh, and. Uh, while we all hope there won't be any such cases elsewhere, uh, uh, we are all concerned that there might well be. And before I call on, on uh, our first witness, uh, um, let me just put this series of hearings in some kind of perspective. As Congressman Shays uh, suggested, most of our focus uh, last year was on HUD Central on well-connected political consultants, so-called, and others, as they obtained special favors and uh, major problems at the headquarters office of the department. We are now moving out into the field. And the Passaic investigation is the first of uh, several that we have uh, scheduled and planned in an attempt to uh, clean up the operation uh, throughout the country where cleaning up is required. Before calling on our first witness, the Inspector General, uh, I personally want to express my appreciation to him. Uh, he has been extremely pivotal in um, discovering the problems, in bringing these problems <clears throat> to the attention of both the secretary and the subcommittee. And I <clears throat> look, I'm looking forward to working with Mr. Adams and his staff uh, for a long time. 
Uh, if I may ask you, Mr. Adams and um, Mr. Kane, to stand uh, so I may swear you in. Raise your right hand. You solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you, God. I do. Please be seated. <coughs> Mr. Adams, um, I asked you in preparation for this hearing to outline for the subcommittee the major areas in which your agency is engaged in. And then I ask you to deal with Passaic uh, specifically. Uh, in order to uh, deal with that issue first, may I suggest we first deal with the uh, Passaic New Jersey Housing Authority issue and then deal with general issues that the IG's office is dealing with. Uh, you are accompanied uh, this morning by Mr. Paul Kane, who is the Regional Inspector for General Audit in Region 2, and we are pleased to have you, Mr. Kane. Uh, Mr. Adams, uh, we have your entire written testimony. It will be entered in the record without objection, and you may proceed in any way you choose. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before you begin, if I may interrupt you one more time, I want to thank uh, Mr. Jerry Hutton, of the subcommittee staff for uh, doing an excellent job in putting this hearing together. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today to provide you the overview of the recently completed audit of the Passaic, New Jersey Housing Authority. At your request, I have submitted for the record an overview of our work during the past six months. This report was sent to you and the other members of the committee, subcommittee on November the 27th of 1989. In addition, we provided the subcommittee staff uh, with a briefing on November the uh, 29th detailing the department's most serious problems. Before turning to the Passaic New Jersey Housing Authority, I'd like to take this opportunity to recognize the instrumental role played by this subcommittee and the staff in bringing about uh, the attention to the HUD problems, the attention focused by the subcommittee on the longstanding problems coupled with the Secretary's aggressive action on our audit recommendations, created a climate in which substantive positive changes have occurred. Just prior to the recess, Secretary Kemp proposed a sweeping package of legislation designed to protect the Department from political favoritism, fraud, and abuse, as well as mismanagement. More than 50 proposals for improvements are a direct result of our audits and investigative work. The Congress overwhelmingly cleared the reform package in November of last year. In the intervening months, the Department has moved swiftly to put in place a strong foundation that will restore managerial and financial integrity and accountability to HUD's programs. I also want to assure you that our office will continue to closely review and monitor all aspects of the Department's programs and operations. While it's too soon to predict the success of many of the reforms presently underway, you can be assured we'll continue to evaluate their effectiveness. I'd also uh, will continue to report fully and timely on critical problems as they are brought to my attention. Moving to the Passaic New Jersey Housing Authority, it was the part uh, of a larger audit that we had undertaken in connection with the CIAP program, and the initial objectives of that were to evaluate the program to determine if the program funds were based on actual needs. Could you, for the record, just sketch in a minute or so what the CAP program is? It's the Comprehensive Improvement Assistance Program. It is funds provided by the department or the local housing authorities to undertake a comprehensive improvement of particularly identified projects within that authority. They make applications for those monies. Those applications review the department, makes that determination, and awards the money for that purpose. Basically, it is the renovation, upgrade, upgrading make of existing public housing units. Public housing units to make improvements to improve the livability and the conditions under which the tenants occupy those units. All right. But basically, what you are saying is that these are funds specifically approved by the Congress of the United States to make public housing units livable. Correct. So if the kitchen isn't working or the bathroom isn't working or the roof is leaking, these funds are used to repair, make livable, upgrade those units. Correct. And to the extent that funds are siphoned away 
from the purposes that the funds were appropriated to preposterously exaggerated multiple salaries, then families living in these units, which may have a leaking roof or a non-functioning kitchen or bathroom, those repairs won't get done. Is that correct? That's correct, sir. So actually you are stealing money if you illegally use CAP funds from badly needed repairs. Yes, sir. That's what we are talking about. I would agree with that. Please go ahead. Briefly, the audit was performed during the period of February through September of last year, and it generally covered the period January 1st, 86 through December 31st of 1988. This review found an eligible cost of more than $950,000. In addition, cost of $180,000 could not be supported and cost efficiencies of over $540,000 could be realized if our recommendations are implemented. Passaic was selected for review based on a survey we performed in the New York area office. Initially, four PHAs were identified as possible auditees. After further discussion with the New York staff, PH, PHAs public, are housing, public authority. housing authorities. I will always insist that all of our witnesses spell these things out. So, thank you, sir. People who don't live with this uh, vocabulary and jargon. My apologies. No problem. After further discussions with the personnel in the New York office, we selected the Housing Authority of Passaic. Give you a little background concerning the Housing Authority. It was established in 1945 provide low rent housing to needy residents of the city of Passaic. It administers some 699 low rent units, 1,056 section 8 units, and 192 section 23 units. Federal assistance to the public housing authority plus its operating income for the three year period into December 31st, 1988 amounted to more than $38 million. Our review disclosed the following deficiencies. You characterize those very well, but let me just repeat them if I might. Compensation paid to selected principal employees exceeded the amounts approved for the positions. Certain public housing authority employees were paid compensation for unused vacation leave and for unused sick leave prior to retirement in excess of what was permitted. Legal services were obtained without benefit of competitive negotiation or without prior written approval of HUD. Seven public housing authority officials attended an out-of-town conference and incurred an unreasonable travel cost. Unsupported credit card charges were paid by the PHA and unsupported travel expense reimbursements were made. The PHA did not inventory its property, keep accurate property records, and, dis and disposed of property uh, without uh, complying with the requirements. The PHA charged for items not included in the HUD approved budget and funds were reported to HUD as obligated when they were not obligated. And the proration of salaries and fringe benefits among programs were not supported and internal controls were not reliable. These deficiencies occurred because the Public Housing Authority Board of Commissioners failed to exercise proper oversight and control of the Public Housing Authority. For example, the board routinely passed resolutions granting salary or fringe benefits without regard to the HUD regulations. The Public Housing Authority submitted inaccurate and misleading information to the HUD office in New York, New Jersey. For example, budgets were inflated by including vacant positions and by overstating salaries of maintenance and clerical workers. Program budgets approved for administrative costs which averaged over eight and one half percent per year. This is four percent more than is normally budgeted for administrative costs. The New York area offices monitoring procedures were not sufficient to detect the improper practices. Several areas where procedures could be changed to help prevent the abuses found at the Public Housing Authority include requiring budgets to show time, uh, excuse me, to show name, title, and percentage of time each employee will devote to each position. Let me stop you there for a second. One of the most remarkable things in this uh, Passaic investigation 
which does boggle the mind is that one individual occupied two full-time and two one-third time positions plus received additional compensation for uh, what we will explore as so-called compensatory time. Let me be sure I understand how this works. Uh, let's take any office. Let's take a congressional office. Let's assume that in the congressional office you have a fellow called an administrative assistant, which is a full-time job. Then let's assume that this congressional office also has budgeted a full-time position for a press secretary. Let's assume the congressional office has a, a, a one-third time job uh, budgeted as uh, uh, legal counsel and a one-third time job uh, as uh, investigator. The assumption would be that the two full-time jobs are held by two separate individuals. And the assumption is that the other two positions, the two part-time positions, are either held by two separate individuals on a part-time basis, or maybe they could be combined, if each one is a third time, into one person's job. He would be working two-thirds of the time. But you would certainly not expect that in a congressional office one individual gets a full-time salary for serving as administrative assistant. That same individual gets a full-time salary for serving as press secretary. That same individual gets a third salary, one third time salary serving as legal counsel. And that same individual gets a one third time salary as an investigator plus all kinds of compensatory uh, uh, allowances. Is that basically what happened at Passaic? That's correct, sir. The person received the compensation for all four positions, two of them being full-time positions and two being part-time positions. Plus additional money. Correct, sir. Now, uh, what was your reaction when you first discovered this? Amazement. I, I've follow your line uh, quite uh, closely that uh, unless advice to the contrary, if a position is funded, uh, we assume that one person is occupying it and only one and not concurrently occupying two positions. And your basic answer to the logical question, how could this thing go on, is that in submitting the budget, they did not have to designate a name because That's in case uh, they were to designate a name, you would see the same name four times, and you say, this guy is getting four salaries instead of one salary. That's correct. Uh, have you initiated steps that henceforth all of these positions will have to be designated by name? That is one of the recommendations we've made, and I believe the, uh, Mr. Janice, who will testify later, will give you the details on the procedures they're implementing to assure that, Mr. Chairman. All right, and how long did this uh, quadruple dipping go on, Mr. Adams? We know that it went on for at least the three-year period we looked at. Uh, we did not have access to records beyond that, but uh, preliminary indications of why they precede that. But I'll let Mr. Kane clarify that if uh, he has. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, we're not sure exactly how long it uh, has gone on, but we're sure it's <laughs> lasted for at least the past three years and very well could have preceded that period. But we have not gone back in time to make that determination. Now, how frequently did the Public Housing Authority Board of Commissioners meet, Mr. Kane? Well, I think at least monthly, maybe more often, but at least monthly they usually meet. At least monthly. And uh, they met with the director of the Public Housing Authority? Yes, Mr. Chairman. And then when they had to deal with one of these other jobs, they called somebody else and he again appeared as the person who was doing that job. Explain this to me, because it, <laughs> it, it, it sort of strikes me as the theater of the absurd. Proceed. And how many individuals on the Public Housing Authority Board of Commissioners? Uh, Mr. Chairman, there's seven uh, members on the board. Uh, in adults, general, all adults. 
Yes, <laughs> yes, Mr. Chairman. And they knew that Mr. Margolio was performing all four of these jobs. He did he physically wear four hats? I mean, change costumes as he moved from one job to another. Explain how it worked. Well, the, the chair, uh, the board did pass a resolution authorizing uh, Mr. Maguglio to occupy these various positions. So they were fully aware of uh, exactly what was going on. Uh, now, why would why would seven adults do that? I can't answer that, Mr. Chairman. Did you ask them? No. We did not meet with the board. You, you didn't meet with the board. And was there any, I, I don't want to interrupt you, Mr. Adams, but the whole thing has such an air of unreality that, that uh, I just want to be sure I'm following you. Well, go I ahead. I appreciate and, uh, your concern. I'll, I'll ask, <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's uh, total bewilderment. I, 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 uh, at my age, I never expect to see any surprises, but uh, this uh, <coughs> prosaic puzzle is, is one. Please go ahead. Okay. Another recommendation is we're making is requiring a support to the budget a listing of the employees receiving compensation, which may not be included in the listing of the salaried positions. Explain that to me a little bit. Would be a listing of any individual who was receiving compensation other than just the salary in the form of bonuses or other related types of compensation, like the annuity that you mentioned earlier that was being paid for by the authority. So in this case, specifically identify those. your recommendation is that if, uh, if a board would like to do this again, which I suspect after this hearing is unlikely, uh, but if a board would like to do this again, they would have to list Mr. I don't want to use your name, but let's say Mr. Paul Adams, full-time salary for job A, Mr. Paul Adams, full-time salary for job B, right. part-time salary, Paul Adams for job C, part-time salary for job D, plus compensatory time. Tell me about compensatory time, because that is really the, sort of the funniest of all of these. I'm not sure I could do it justice, so I'll defer to my associate, Mr. Right, Mr. Kane, if Kane, I might. why don't you explain <coughs> how ha holding down four jobs, Mr. Mergulio had time to uh, obtain compensatory time. What did this time compensate him for? Uh, <clears throat> when Mr. McGuglio worked through his lunch hour, he would... Well, explain uh, to me first what compensatory time is in the real world. Compensatory time is any time worked over and above the normal working hours. Okay, so let's assume that I work a 40-hour week, uh, which is more than the full-time work at the Public Housing Authority and per se. But let's assume it's a 40-hour week. And I work 50 hours this week. That gives me 10 hours of compensatory time, which presumably allows me next week to work only 30 hours. Is, would that be the proper use of compensatory time? No, the compensatory time is more like overtime. If you work 10 hours overtime in a week, uh, in some cases, depending on your job classification, you could be paid for it. In the case of administrative... But could I take it out in, in reduced workload in the next time period? You, you could. You know, I don't think generally that's the way it's done, but that's possible. There are some agencies within the federal government okay. that permit you to work a uh, 10-hour day and sort of take a day off uh, at the end of the two-week period, as right. opposed now, to working now, eight hours. As I understand you, if I work more than my designated time period, which we assume is 40 hours, then I sort of bank these extra hours. And depending on the agency, <clears throat> I can I either reduce my working time in a subsequent period or get paid for these extra hours I worked. Is that correct? Well, we disagree with the, uh, the payment factor as far as a, an executive is concerned. Uh, they I'm would coming be to that, but this does not apply to executives, does it? Right. I mean, they get correct. a flat salary, and if they work an extra 10 hours, that's part of the job. That's our position, Mr. Well, that's Chairman. the only rational position that any, any private or public agency would have. So the very notion of compensatory time for an executive level employee is unacceptable. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. And then we have two further recommendations. One is the establishing of criteria as to the percentage of administrative costs that can be charged to the Comprehensive Improvement Assistance Program. And lastly, the evaluating the monitoring procedures to determine whether they are sufficient to detect the type of abuses we found at the Passaic Housing Authority. 
As a result of the problems we found at Passaic, I have asked that our 10 regional inspectors general review all reports of independent public auditors and of our own staff for the preceding years of 1988, 89, and 90 to determine whether similar problems may exist elsewhere. I've also already asked them to undertake interviews with the housing directors in each of the regional offices to determine if they have knowledge of that. The preliminary indications, Mr. Chairman, is that as concerns the compensation question, we don't find that to be a, a pervasive problem. We have found a couple of rather insignificant examples of that in very nominal amounts, and we're pursuing those further. I'd uh, again like to thank you and the members of the subcommittee and for the role you've played in addressing these problems, and I appreciate the courtesies extended by the subcommittee and its members. And lastly, uh, I'd like to say the how encouraged I am by Secretary Kemp's quick and decisive actions to install new management reforms in the department. It's refreshing. Uh, that concludes my remarks, and I'll be pleased to respond to any questions you or any member Thank may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Adams. Mr. Kane, do you have some opening observations to make? No. No, Mr. Chairman. Okay, then let me, let me just ask both of you a number of questions and then turn to my colleagues. Uh, I've become an avid reader of the, of the regional press around Passaic lately. And uh, one, of the, one of the articles written by Patricia Alex, staff writer for the New Jersey Record, January 23, caught my attention. This is what she says in part. Watching through the windows of City Hall, as federal marshals descended on the Public Housing Authority building, city workers were amused. Quote, it reminds me of Romania, said one. I was waiting for a helicopter to land on top of the Housing Authority and start whisking people away, end quote. Across the street at the Spear Village Apartments, the Public Housing Authority's largest complex for low-income residents, word spread quickly, quote, they got busted, they got busted, said 23-year-old Jay McCoy, who grew up in the complex. And it's about time those people were making too much money for themselves and not spending enough on us, end quote. Now, one would think that on the basis of these two random quotes, and there are lots of others, there was a fairly widespread understanding in the community that shenanigans were going on. People were being quadruple dipping uh, plus. How do you explain, Mr. Kane, you are the regional IG inspector for, for that area, that uh, HUD didn't know anything about this. Or if he did, he didn't do anything about it. Well, I don't think the field office was aware of the extent uh, of some of the problems at the Housing Authority. With respect to what the local uh, uh, people may have known, I don't know that this information had been shared with the field office. The well, field how often would you think the field office makes a visit to the local housing authorities, on the average? I'm sure they visit the housing authority several times a year, and they perform monitoring reviews at periodic times, I believe, at least once every three years. I'm, I'm not sure that's correct, but I, I think it's uh, accurate. We could probably verify that. Now, when they go out to visit, they meet with the key staff, Yes, sir. Well, how did they meet with the key staff in this instance when, as they called in, they says, well, bring in the contracting officer, the purchasing officer, the modernization officer, the compliance officer, and the director, and, uh, and uh, the fellow said, that's me. <laughs> Explain this to me, because it, it, it absolutely is incomprehensible to the, to the simple, rational, common sense of, uh, of an adult looking at this. I'm not exactly sure the manner in which the field office conducted these reviews, but generally uh, they would meet with the executive director, the deputy executive director, and the other uh, high officials in the housing authority 
But whether they had all, a, all the other high officials were the same people. Uh, well, those, the three top people in the Housing Authority is the Executive Director, the Deputy, and the Director of Operations. They were all people that actually existed and held it. Those positions plus other positions. Uh, the field office did start questioning the Housing Authority with respect to who was holding certain positions. And what prompted them to question the Housing Authority? I think mainly because of the high administrative cost. Uh, there was a study performed by the field office which indicated that the administrative cost was probably twice as high as some of the other housing authorities, and they started asking questions. It turned out that the modernization officer and the modernization specialist, uh, these positions were occupied by the executive director and the executive direct deputy director. Uh, however, the <coughs> PHA did not uh, advise the, uh, the field office of the, the individuals who were act actually occupying those positions. They gave them different names initially, and it wasn't until we were in there doing the audit that we discovered that they were one and the same. What did you say at the moment of discovery? I spoke with the executive director and I asked him how any one individual can hold down these various positions, and his only response was that the work has been completed. That was it. And what did you respond when he said the work has been completed? Well, I didn't accept that, you know, as a reasonable response. The Housing Authority has taken a position, and they, they recognized in their response to the order report that no one individual can spend more than 100% of his time on various uh, job titles. Uh, their position appears now to be that any one individual can hold down multiple positions. However, uh, our position is, if these are full-time positions, we don't see how this is possible. As you illustrated earlier, uh, an individual can hold down a, a part-time position, another part-time position, which, which might equal one full-time position. Sure. And we accept that. There's no problem with uh, that. But what the Housing Authority's position at present is that these are really just, just different job titles, and only 100% of his time is being devoted to those four positions. But that is not HUD's understanding of the budget submission. The budget was submitted with two full-time positions and two part-time positions. Well, would you suggest that the, the budget submissions were fraudulent? I don't know whether I can use the word fraudulent, but uh, I do think they were misleading uh, and to some extent because there were <clears throat> several positions, I think 11 positions were vacant and never filled and also that these other various positions were being occupied by the same person. I'd like to ask either of you to answer this. Does anyone truly believe that this individual worked two full-time and two one-third time positions simultaneously? I do not. And I can't believe anyone else would either. Well, who certified that he did, Mr. Adams? Um, Mr. Chairman, I don't think there's a certification required. They submit a budget listing the positions that they feel uh, are necessary to operate the Housing Authority, and uh, it's approved by the field office. But there's no actual certification required that I'm aware of that the executive director filled these various positions and performed the duties of those positions. However, when the budget is submitted, that's the only assumption that the field office can make, that there is, you know, two or three different individuals filling these positions. It's not an unreasonable assumption. It's my understanding that the Basaic Housing Authority has hired an attorney to contest your audit. Is that correct? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Are HUD funds being used to pay this attorney? I believe the field office has notified the Housing Authority that they were not to use Housing Authority funds to pay for the attorney. But that does not necessarily preclude them from doing so? Until such time as HUD actually had control of the Housing Authority, uh, HUD was really prohibited from uh, stopping such an action. Now that HUD has taken the authority over, I would assume they, they have that authority. Mm -hmm. So what exactly would happen with that contract between the attorney and the Housing Authority? I'm not sure at this time. I will ask this of, uh, of the general counsel because it's a legal question, but I also would like to ask this of you. 
Have these people been charged with criminal wrongdoing? Not to my knowledge, Mr. Chairman. We do have an ongoing investigation with respect to it, though. So they have not yet been charged with That's criminal correct. wrongdoing. Are we dealing here with the defrauding of the United States government? I think that's a reasonable assumption, and uh, we'll take further investigation to determine if there are violations of the federal criminal statutes which are prosecutable. Now, we have received allegations from the Passaic uh, Public Housing Authority tenant group, one of the tenant groups, that letters and requests for actions against Mr. Paul Margulio that included reports of his holding multiple positions were sent to Secretary Pierce and the HUD's New York Regional Office as early as 1982, but that no action was taken or reply received to these requests. Have you found uh, any of these uh, materials in your investigation? None have come to my attention, Mr. Chairman. Also, i would heard of this. I had our office to research our indices, and we find no record of any complaints along those lines to us. And we've conducted some preliminary inquiries with the uh, staff, and we how, found no evidence. How about your inquiry on this, Mr. Kane? Uh, Mr. Chairman, we did the same thing in New York and in Newark, and we were unable to find any uh, indication that such referrals were made to our office. How could it have been, Mr. Adams, that the Newark Regional Office uh, did not know what was going on in Passaic? I asked uh, the staff when it was brought to my attention uh, that same question, <coughs> Mr. Chairman. Um, there was an initial indication of the dual compensation uh, surfaced by the independent public accountant who does the audit of the Public Housing Authority each year, and that was the first notification. Uh, the staff tells me even as they began their work to do it that you had to probe quite deeply in the records to discover the actual uh, payments and to whom they were going. Um, but so I think that there is some, some form of disguise of it or that makes it difficult to detect in the process also. Well, didn't the payroll office have to issue at the end of the year the IRS slips and didn't those slips indicate the same names for all four jobs? The same name for all four jobs? I don't believe they issue one for the position. They issue one to the payment made to the individuals. At one point during the course of the audit, Mr. Kane tells me that we requested uh, the W-2s, the statements of earnings that are yes. filed with the Internal Revenue Service. Initially, we were provided with a W-2 which would have shown only the earnings for the position of executive director. Uh, his number one job. Correct. What about and the later W2 we, we, forms for the others? We later determined that that was not the real W-2 as supposedly submitted to the Internal Revenue Service, that the W-2 submitted to the Internal Revenue Service actually shows a larger amount, and I can't recall, Mr. Kane, maybe you can, that was, would you? 180, <coughs> I think for uh, the executive director it was $182,000, as opposed to uh, approximately $84,000 which was shown on the W-2 that was presented to us initially. You mean it was a fraudulent W-2 form that was given to you during the course of your investigation? Yes, sir. It was a W-2 form which was fabricated? It appears to have been fabricated for that purpose, yes, sir. Now let me deal with this compensatory time a bit longer. This gentleman is performing his four simultaneous jobs. And while that's praiseworthy, uh, he also occasionally has to eat. Do I understand that during his lunch hour, he is charging her time and a half for eating his sandwich? Yes, Mr. Chairman, if he worked through his Explain lunch. Explain that to me. Uh, he, I guess they felt if they worked through their lunch hour, they're entitled to compensatory time, and it was charged at the rate of uh, time and a half. And who verified that in addition to eating his sandwich and drinking whatever he is drinking, he was working during that period? 
I think because of his position, there was really no one else in the authority that had uh, authority over his activities, therefore probably verified in himself. So he self-certified that while eating his lunch, he was also working? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Would thinking be considered working? <laughs> I, I guess in some cases, possibly. Mm -hmm. How about watching the television news? I, I, I guess it depends on, you know, the How about the reading the newspaper? In most cases, I would say no. You know, unless they're directly related to your job responsibilities, which in this case, I don't think they would be. Yeah. And he, he charged her time and a half for eating his lunch? Yes, Mr. Chairman. How about eating his breakfast? I don't believe so. We didn't say anything like Just that. Just lunch? Yes. He ate breakfast and dinner on his own time. But yeah. lunch, he charged hard time and a half. There were cases when he uh, charged compensatory time when he came early or he left late. There's an instance where he traveled to Florida to attend a convention where I believe he charged us with 18 hours of compensatory time, which would be a time of 12 hours and time and a half would be 18 hours. You mean to get down to the convention? On a, on a Saturday. He charged hard time and a half for travel? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Is that allowable under HUD rules? We don't believe so. That's why we took exception to it. Now, I read in your uh, Inspector General's report that the housing manager showed two sets of time cards for the same pay period, each showing different hours worked. Explain that to me. Uh, we, we asked for the time records to support uh, some of the overtime and some of the time yes. that was being paid. And we had two sets of time records for the exact same pay period, <coughs> each showing different hours worked. Uh, now, the gentleman in question has regular retirement benefits, is that correct? Yes, Mr. Chairman. On top of this, the Board of Commissioners approved for him a retirement annuity. At, a, at an annual premium cost of $10,000? Yes, sir. Was that legal? Uh, well, it wasn't comparable to local public practice, and that's generally the criteria we use to, to measure such compensation or such benefits. Uh, in this case, he was comparable to the superintendent of schools, and as our understanding, the superintendent of schools did not have that benefit, therefore he's not entitled to it. <coughs> Under the HUD rules. Now, he had a public housing authority credit card. Is that correct? Yes, Mr. Chairman. And he charged his expenses, travel and otherwise, to that credit card. We're not as exactly sure what was charged to the credit card because there are no receipts to evaluate the charges. We've asked for them, and uh, the response that we received was that after a six-month period, he purged the files of those receipts. I, I should think so, yeah. <laughs> Uh, did you obtain the records from the company issuing the credit card? What credit card are we talking about? American Express. Have we did not. We did not receive any uh, anything from American Express. Express, but he has requested <coughs> that information for us, and he said he would provide it to us when he received it. <coughs> we do know there were charges made to the credit card, Mr. Chairman. As I recall, with some twenty-one thousand. Twenty-four, twenty-five thousand dollars worth of charges. Okay. On top of the credit card, there was an expense allowance of seventy-five hundred dollars paid. That's correct. Is it uh, accurate to say that the individual in question received compensation exceeding that of the president of the United States? My understanding is the president currently earns two hundred thousand dollars a year. And how much <coughs> did this individual earn? I'm using the word "earn" in a in quotation marks? Uh, approximately $246,000 in the year 1988. So the director of the Passaic Public Housing Authority is compensated at a rate about 25% higher than the President of the United States. That's correct. Congressman Lukens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Allow me to apologize for my uh, departure and reentry. I have a full committee hearing on the, the Panama a bill plus a couple amendments my own and a resolution before the Foreign Affairs Committee. In any event, I will try to pick up where the chairman has left off. I would like to go back and re-clarify for my personal benefit a couple of points. 
uh, you stated when he asked you if the gym, the individual received one uh, 150 or a time and a half for travel to, I think, Florida for purposes of conference or convention. And you said you didn't believe so. Uh, is there not a, a set of uh, very specific guidelines for travel expenses and a day of travel to it, a day of travel back? Aren't there guidelines for that? <clears throat> Uh, that was one of the problems that we, uh, we found at the Housing Authority. The, pers the travel policy was not specific enough to, to restrict some of the actions that uh, were occurring. Uh, for example, the federal uh, travel regulations are very strict with respect to uh, time of departure and the per diem rates and so on and so forth. However, their policy permitted travel two days prior to a convention and two days subsequent to a convention. Forgive me, is that the PHA policy? Yes, sir. Is there not a general HUD policy or an even more general federal employment policy on travel? No, the, <clears throat> the policy with respect to travel is based on comparability for the local community. The policy of the city of Passaic was very general in itself, and I believe it, it used the word uh, reasonable reimbursement. Or, or something to those that effect, or actual cost. But it, it was not specific enough where we could take uh, exception to, uh, to the policy. Forgive my partial or complete obtuseness, but I don't understand. Are you telling me that the PHA travel time reimbursement is linked to local procedure? Yes, sir. And local this comparability is, in all the forms of compensation, whether or not it be salary, local practice, so if you had a city that was not particularly noteworthy for strict accountability, the PHA could simply emulate that practice and lead to this type of uh, misadventure. Yes, sir. Uh, another clarification. Uh, I, the, gentleman, the chairman raised very astutely, as usual, the issue of the retirement annuity of $10,000. Is that also linked to local... Uh, accountability or local practice? If the, the individual that uh, the executive director was comparable to had such a policy, then this would be permitted under a comparability uh, comparison. But I, I think we have to evaluate also whether or not there's a reasonableness factor in, in, in some of these policies. For example, if there was a city that was inclined to go you know, off in left field with respect to the granting of uh, benefits and, and such, I think we would take a position that this may not be reasonable or necessary. But basically, the salaries and all the benefits that the Housing Authority receive uh, are linked to local comparability. What well, seems to be local comparability may get us in a morass of misdeeds before we're through. If this is just the tip of the iceberg, or hopefully it's just one incident, but my gut feeling, and in fact my experience in this committee teaches me that there's a lot more to come, and if you don't have tight local controls, uh, I see no reason why they should have any impact whatsoever on a federally funded program dispersing federal dollars. Let me make this point. You use as the example the local superintendent of schools, I believe. Yes, sir. Was that a county-wide superintendent or a, a, just a school system-wide superintendent? City of Passaic. The City of Passaic. I don't see what his reimbursement or his travel time or his retirement annuity would have to do at all with a person who is hitting a public housing authority totally on federal time, federal dollars, occupying federal space, supposedly in the public interest of the federal community. I don't see that similarity. Is that policy at HUD today? The annual contribution contract uh, provides for such comparability. And the comparability factor to be considered is, is not the salary itself, it's the job duties. Uh, in order to establish comparability, what, what you're supposed to do is go to the local community and determine who in that community has similar job responsibilities. And based on that, that determines your your comparability or your compensation also determines your benefits. It, it, it really bothers me that we go to a local community for comparable benefits and annuities in terms of service to a constituency in relative to a federal employee. 
I am, I am really astounded at this revelation, which for some reason, Mr. Chairman, has never come to my attention in the, in the year and a half of hearings now. Let me just try to... clarification, Mr. Lukens. Pardon me? A point of clarification, of if I might. Uh, I think I heard you refer to them as federal employees. They're not federal employees. They're local employees, the public housing authority officials are. They're paid for by local dollars. Passed through from the federal government. They're federal dollars. Okay. Now, the chairman has already set that precedent six months ago about whether or not it was... No, I didn't mean to argue. I just want to clarify that we're well, not traditionally they're, they're federal employees. They're using federal dollars. Yeah. Okay. They're yeah. occupying federal uh, facilities that paid for by the federal government. Right. They're doing federal work on federal time with federal benefits in the federal interest, but they're not pursuing federal interest. And I just don't see why we should... Leave. Anyway, I am upset with the fact that they, apparently we have this policy. All right. And I realize it's not your fault. I'm just, I am just a little bit flabbergasted because I just found this out this morning. This, this really bothers me. Let me go further on this. <laughs> if we have any person employed by public housing authority who is in a position to sign his own paperwork, as this gentleman, as this person was allowed to do, and I'm correct so far, right? He, he reviewed his own submission of paperwork. Yes, sir. He, he's, he <clears throat> could self-voucher all his expenses, self-approved. Is that correct? Well, the uh, chairman and the vice chairman signed the checks uh, in this case, but and he would submit these uh, billings to uh, the board who would then approve them. So he doesn't have sole, you know, uh, authority to uh, write checks, and but basically you're, you're correct. Let me uh, walk through for the purpose of edification. I, I know the answer, but who appoints the members of the Public Housing Authority? Okay, one member is appointed by the uh, Director of the Department of Community Affairs for the State of New Jersey. One member is appointed by the Mayor of the City of Passaic, and the City Council uh, appoints the five remaining uh, members. Is the first authority to review vouchers or the budget, the public housing authority? Yes, sir. Once that review, is, you would think that they would really be very careful because do they have, don't they have a, a limited liability? I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, if something went wrong and they signed it, just like SNLs, uh, we've got directors of SNLs in real trouble now because they have a liability for the actions of the SNLs that went under and took this country for 100 to $200 billion. Is there not a similar kind of liability or limited liability for a person serving on a PHA, board of... Uh, uh, not that I'm aware of. These are uncompensated positions as the commissioners. Will, I think Mr. Keating would be, or Mr. Janice might be able to clarify it further for you, but the commissioners are uncompensated positions, and so I'm not sure there's any personal liability involved. The chairman, permit, I'd still like to pursue this a little bit further. I mean, we, we can appoint these people. They have no liability whatsoever for their actions. That's Only for, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, that's correct. Uh, I mean, I think they have some responsibility for their actions. Not there a responsibility, is, a liability, a legal liability. They have uh, no Again, I think that, as Paul suggested, that it's really a legal question. I wonder if some person who has legal expertise can mention. We have the legal counsel testify shortly. General counsel. Uh, the chairman has informed me that we have the legal counsel testifying shortly, but I'd like that, that answer to that question to hang poignant over these hearings. I, I am, again, a little surprised that you can have seven well meaning individuals, but totally inexperienced in housing, totally inexperienced in budgets, with absolutely no accountability for their actions. Now, they have moral responsibility, but that may be it, in which case, you know, there's really no accountability. Now, step up. I'm trying to trace the degrees and the, the channel of authority or responsibility for review. So he would submit, in, any person this or, in this organization or this position would submit his own vouchers saying, this is what I spent, or this is my salary, these are four jobs I want to have, or three and a half jobs I want to have, or two and one third jobs I want to have. And his first place he should have been questioned was at the public housing authority level. Yes, sir. That didn't happen, <clears throat> did it? Well, as we, I said earlier, the board did approve uh, him having these various positions. But they did not but challenge wrongly, it or question Would you say that. they wrongly did that? That was a mistake? I think it was a mistake, yes. I think it was a gross mistake. It was a basic, total error. It was a stupid mistake. I can't conceive of anyone that paid attention letting a man have two and a third salaries, let alone two and a third jobs. But at any rate, that's the first time. I'm trying to trace the accountability here. Now, once that's been approved by the PHA, 
it goes to the Newark field office, is that correct? That's correct. Are you understaffed at that office to detect this kind of thing? Uh, we're not part of the field office, Mr. Lucan. I'm sorry, I thought uh, you were the director of the field office. No, no. no. He's no. our regional inspector general. I'm, I beg your pardon. Sir. I thought you were representing them in this case. No. You're not. No, I, so you're not familiar with the operation of Newark Field Office specifically? I, I couldn't really respond to a question as to whether or not they're understaffed in, in that area. You know, I think it would be more of a field office. Uh. Mr. Chairman, what I'm trying to get at here is that we have a channel of responsibility set up legally and through administrative law to, to do exactly what this agency has not done apparently since its inception. And that's to supervise the operation of the disbursement of billions of dollars for public housing. And apparently in this case, not only did the local board, which should have a great interest in local housing issues and using those dollars most effectively for the poor and low cost and moderate priced house, housing, fail to do its job, they didn't pay attention. I mean, just I can't conceive a board member letting this just go through unless he simply read the minutes or wasn't, wasn't there. But even if he did make a mistake, he or she, consciously and purposely allow this to go through, there's apparently no liability. So I, I'm concerned about how we expect HUD to operate with this kind of local absence of supervision and accountability. What I'm interested in next, I guess you gentlemen cannot answer for me, Mr. Chairman, I, I'd like to know at what person or what title or what trained individual at what level next gets the review authority. Because we obviously have a total breakdown in anyone capturing the multiplicity of incidents of malfeasance and apparent criminal wrongdoing at any level whatsoever. And I think the higher up the bureaucracy, the harder it would be to detect. Let me ask a couple more questions here to wrap up. A little more specific, I assume that you gentlemen are totally equipped to answer this. The Passaic PHA reported $2,900,000 as being obligated for CIP projects as of December 31, 87. However, as you, I think, said in your statement, your office found only a million seven obligated <coughs> for CIAP projects. And I'm a little confused, I'm not confused, I'm wondering what happened to the one million two hundred thousand dollars more or less uh, tied up. What happened to the rest of the money? I mean, how do we trace that kind of, uh, of um, how, how do you trace money that's missing like that in its uh, initial account? Uh, <clears throat> I don't think the funds are, were missing. What had happened is the the Public Housing Authority was required to report to the field office exactly how much of the CAP money that they had been allotted is under contract or obligated. They reported that uh, the entire amount was uh, obligated when in fact it was not. These funds were subsequently reprogrammed into new activities uh, at a later date. Forgive and me, it, who does that reprogramming? The, field, the Public Housing Authority would submit uh, a revised budget to the field office that the field office would approve it. So there is a system through which they have to get reapproval for reuse of the money in That's another correct. area. That's correct, yes. All right. In order for CAP funds to be obligated, a contract must be executed for work which is to be done. In your audit report of the SAIC PHA, you reported some projects did not have contracts awarded or if awarded were not for as much as PHA claimed. What kind of reporting controls are in place to assure that you can capture that kind of, uh, you can capture funds that are in between those cracks. Ones are reported to be contracted, ones are under-reported as in the contract or over-reported. How do you, how do you capture that kind of missing dollars? How do you find them? Well, there is a form that's submitted to the field office which would report uh, this type of information. Uh, basically what's been obligated, what's under contract, and what's left to be obligated. The information that was being reported to the field office was inaccurate. This is my whole point. The if, that, if those accounting reports were, and I suppose there are accounting reports, so I don't know what they're called. Yes, that's correct. Are inaccurate. How, how do you capture the, the uh, accuracy? I mean, how, how do you find out what the truth is? The, it would be difficult for the field office to make that determination by looking just at the form itself. Uh, probably the best way to uh, determine whether or not the form is accurate is to go out to the Public Housing Authority and test the accuracy of the forms. What would make you doubt the accuracy of the form in the first place that would generate an on-site review? If uh, 
if they had been inspected by some of the engineering people or some of the con, uh, construction uh, representatives of the field office, and they were aware of the fact that, for example, if asbestos removal had been completed and it was still being shown as obligated, this may uh, raise a question in their mind that they might want to go out and look at, look at the uh, details. I'm sorry. Is there any requirement anywhere for copies of these executed contracts to be submitted uh, along with the, uh, the, what, the Form 528-26? Um, no, I don't, I don't believe so. Would that accomplish any administrative review purpose to, to require that? If you did have the contracts available to you, you sure, surely could verify the accuracy of the form. You know, I, uh, I'm one of these, Mr. Chairman, members might just deplore requiring more administrative uh, duties when I know that most federal employees are overburdened now with reporting requirements. It seems like perhaps the only way out of this uh, increasing morass of misdeeds is to require more and more paperwork and more and more copies to more and more places so everyone's aware of what's going on. I, I just can't conceive that a person could cause so much, so much damage in apparently in such a short time and be so greedy, apparently greedy and apparently selfish as to commit uh, criminal misdeeds in order just to line his pocket. I mean, just, it astounds me and that no one could capture, uh, sorry, nobody could find out about it for so long. I worry about the system that allows this thing to kind of merrily roll along. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll yield back my time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much, Congressman Shays. Thank you, Ms. Um, for your statement, uh, I'd like to know uh, first what triggered the uh, study of the Housing Authority of the City of Passaic's Comprehensive Improvement Assistance Program. What triggered that investigation? Or was it an audit? An audit, sir. What triggered we the start, audit? We were doing a, a multi-regional audit of the Comprehensive Improvement Assistance Program, and each of the regional inspectors general, which Mr. Kenny is one, was tasked to identify one or more locations at which to do audits of the a Public Housing Authority CAP program. And uh, in his discussions with the Newark office, they looked at uh, four different possibilities and selected uh, Passaic because of some concerns the New York office had along with some concerns that we had uh, brought to our attention through the independent public accountants audit so, for so the it previous year. just by chance. It was uh, finally someone said you better look at the SAIC and take Yes, a look sir. Um, had you had such warnings before? Not uh, to my knowledge. Not that we're aware of. Um, I have the same kind of feeling that I had when Marilyn Harold, the so-called Robin HUD came before us, a kind of this feeling of being in Never Never Land. And uh, in part, um, you, you all are kind of giving me that feeling as well. And I'll explain to you why, and maybe you could just comment. You say um, in the study that you did, you say the comprehensive, the compensation paid to select PHA employees, in our opinion, was unreasonable. This occurred because the PHAs Board of Commissioners approved various resolutions authorizing these payments. By approving the resolutions and allowing compensation to exceed the HUD approved budget, we believe the PHA's Board of Commissioners did not exercise proper oversight. When I go to the next page, it says the Board of Commissioners approved various resolutions allowing PHA employees to hold multiple job titles. In addition, the Board authorized salary increases and in other instances allowed salaries to exceed the budget amounts. Now, when I, I think of the, these statements and I think of, um, Mr. Adams, your statement, and by the way, it's a very good one. You didn't go read, read it all of it, but it is an excellent statement. But, but again, the same kind of comment. By approving the resolutions allowing compensation to exceed the HUD approved budget, the Board of Commissioners did not exercise proper oversight. Don't you think this is a slight understatement? Possibly could be viewed as that, Mr. Chase, yes? Sir. No, but see, this is important. And this is the same kind of discussion we got into last year. It understates it so clearly. I mean, this was a ripoff. And it was a ripoff in which the commissioners participated. And it seems to me that, that, that it would be more honest to just call it that. And I don't know if you're prevented from doing that, but I'm looking at the PHA's response. 
I mean, this is a, a hell of a document. I mean, they basically say, you know, uh, everything was great and justifiable and, and uh, you know, uh, very logical. Just reading one kind of comment, you can almost pick at random. While HUD criticized, criticized the PHA because the executive director holds four titles, two full-time and two part-time, HUD never bothered to confirm that the executive director, in fact, performed all the duties of these titles. My attitude is, so what, that you didn't do that? It said, in fact, the executive director's willingness to accept all these additional responsibilities has saved the authority significant funds. Let me ask you this. Is there, is there um, a federal law that prevents the executive director statute a salary to be 160,000. Could they have paid him 160,000 and been a little more honest about it? It's again, I believe, Mr. Shea, is a question of the local comparability. That's the annual contributions contract between the department, the federal government, and the local housing authority specifies the compensation yeah. will be. On local I want to. I want to be clear. Of this you're saying that the executive director's position through all our 3,300 plus public housing authorities, there is no upper limit set. None to my knowledge, sir. Okay. I need to understand, um, I mean, I think basically uh, the absurdity of this is so clear, I, d I just don't feel we need to, you know, delve in it t too much longer, but, but what I would like to know is um, much along the lines of, of the accountability of being asked by m my, my colleagues, um, it, in a way it seems to me like everybody's kind of washing their hands of this. Uh, HUD Central has said, you know, we don't really control. Um, uh, it appears that we have no regulations that govern even the salaries and so on. Um, I'm struck with tremendous sadness that in the way that uh, these, these individuals who were closest to the needs of the poor were uh, extraordinarily willing to rip off uh, the federal government and deprive uh, the people who they actually work with with benefits because clearly it's not like uh, there were other needs they could have spent this money on. But my question uh, really uh, is this, um, in your judgment, who are the local public housing authorities accountable to? They're accountable to those people who appoint them, they're accountable to the taxpayers, and if they violate uh, the federal laws, they're accountable to the, the judicial system, mm -hmm. Mr. Chase, all of those people. I'm I, I, I know that th that's an, an accurate description, but it's not a helpful one. Um, for instance, in one of the communities that I, that I represent, the mayor can say, uh, well, any mayor can say, I, these, the public housing authority is a federal institution. Uh, I'm not really responsible. I mean, he may make some appointments. Uh, isn't that clear? Isn't that what local mayors sometimes say? That it's, that, you know, they don't have control over the housing authority? I think I've heard that statement made, yes, uh, and, and some, they use it conveniently when there's a problem not to have any responsibility, but uh, when it comes down to the normal routine, it's a local operation. Uh, so it's, it's a convenient uh, either way for them, whichever way is convenient to the moment, I think. And the state clearly says that they're not responsible. And um, we're even hearing that from HUD Central. So really what I'm asking is, um, at the very least, don't you sense that, that we may have to just totally revamp our public housing authorities, that maybe there's a, a message in here that's a little bigger than just the fact that a few individuals knowingly ripped off the system. Uh, you, you, know, you call it not having you know, proper oversight, but I think they were participants. Um, don't you think that, that it would be wise for our committee and others to, to just really take a strong look at totally revamping public housing authorities? I would encourage you to, to take a good thorough look. I think that's the kind of oversight we need in the process, Mr. Gage. Tell me how you would, uh, what you would change to have accountability. I guess uh, you've kind of caught me off guard. I didn't. Yeah, I, I don't mean to. Call, let me put, let me put it to you this way. It, it would just seem to me that that the same questions that are running through my mind must run through your mind because um, uh, I I would bet I would just I would bet honest money on this that that what we see in Passaic we would see in a vast number of our other housing authorities. I mean, I represented one of my housing authorities. The the federal government just removed the executive director and brought in a consultant. What gave them the power to do that? The breach of the contract 
which I referred to earlier, the annual contributions contract, which specifies the conditions. And if they violate that contract, then that can be a, a mechanism by which the department can declare a breach and take over the operations. So, uh, Mr. Keating, who will be testifying later, and Mr. Janis are much better qualified to respond to that question than I am, uh, Mr. Shea. So, uh, okay, I'm going to pursue that with them, but but uh, but you're basically saying to me, it seems to me, that ultimately the federal government uh, is the one accountable for the actions of uh, of public housing authorities, which basically administer um, uh, in many ways um, uh, federal funds, but they also um, they also administer state funds as well. Is that not correct? In some jurisdictions, there's multiple funding. I do not believe there was any state monies involved in this particular no, authority. I think it was all, all the monies from this authority were either generated by rental proceeds or the monies contributed by the federal government. In the state of Connecticut, our public housing authorities oversee federal housing projects and state housing projects. It's not true in this one. Though, yeah. It just seems to me, Mr. Chairman, in the process of this whole effort, that, that our committee staff should really be just really, a, a, it seems to me this is a system designed to fail. Uh, just from from day one, and I would I would make this this comment to you that that I basically felt there wasn't a part of HUD Central that didn't have problems. That there was no moral anchor to to have people judge between right or wrong. The best proof to me, at least in Passaic, that there's no moral anchor is uh, to read the PHA's response. Um, and if and my committee members haven't read it, I I recommend it to you. It is um, it is uh, dynamite reading. Uh, they have no moral anchor. Uh, they justify every illegal act here as if it was just a natural course of doing business. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you, you very much, Congressman <clears throat> Payne. Thank you very much. Um, the concern I have is similar to the line of questioning with um, <clears throat> abuses of this nature going on. It seems to me that the area office would take some initiative to, to look into allegations. The reason I state that is that, as we know, in many instances in public housing, many times there is a lack of, of leadership. In many instances, uh, people who live in public housing feel uh, disenfranchised. They don't feel that they are empowered. And in many instances, you find a lack of leadership and things simply go on uh, without uh, people complaining about it without people questioning. But this is just the opposite in Passaic. Uh, I've got letters here, series of letters that date back to 1982, written directly to Sam Pierce. 1982, a letter written in November of 1982 by the Tenants Council. And they wrote a letter about a complaint that there was a Mr. Andrew Cock Green Cochran, who is the president for 25 years of their housing uh, council. And it's unclear, but they say he's having an annual election, but no one knows who the nominating committee is, how they were selected, et cetera. And it goes on in the second paragraph to say Paul Maguglio, the executive director, has been blocking us from having an organized ten tenant council for many years and using Andrew Cochran as his puppet. And it goes on to say that they just read in the paper about a $4.6 million uh, modernization grant to the Passaic um, Authority. As you know, uh, tenant input is supposed to be uh, in saying what should happen to dollars. It's by regulation that you get the input from tenants. And they were complaining that they didn't know about that uh, and, and would like to, and they would like Sam Pierce directly to to, to be knowledgeable about this. They talk about another officer of the tenants group uh, not living in the, the, the tenant project. Well, several months later in January, a letter was sent from someone in Washington, I think, to say, well, they will be in touch with you from your regional office in Newark. That was on January the 11th from the November 30th letter, and that's of 83. The previous letter was 82. Then Legal Services of Passaic County wrote a letter to Walter Johnson, February 2, 1983, referring to the Pierce letter of November 30, 82, uh, about the, the three-month later response in January, and going on to say that they would like to have the tenants involved in the $4.6 million 
renovation. Then again, another letter in, in July 29th of 83 uh, from the Spear Village Tenants Council with copies, uh, CC to Walter Johnson from the Newark uh, HUD area office, uh, talking about the fact that they would like to ask the Housing Authority to come to a Tenants Council meeting on September the 8th, 83 at 7.30 at 11 Aspen Place to discuss the modernization uh, grant, which I think was sent without, without back. Objection. Open these communications will be placed in the record. Okay, thank you. Then there was a February 14th letter of 1984, where the Tenants Council complained to the Passaic Board, uh, Passaic Housing Authority, about a $500,000 um, addition for upgrading of the administrative offices of the Passaic Housing Authority, with a copy going to Newark HUD. Um, a letter. October 29th, 84, from Walter Johnson about some problems with the electrical, and he went on to explain uh, why um, this thing was going on. Uh, March 5th, 84, letter making uh, a lot of requests. Uh, uh, it was a response from the Housing Authority, which also copies went to Newark. A letter April 27th, 85, where there was some some request under the Freedom of Information Act, this tenant council asked, could they see a copy of, uh, of the um, annual budget, the Passaic Housing Authority 84 expenditure budget. Copies went to HUD, New York, Charles Freeman, um, and, and on and on. Uh, and these are just some letters that the people that I know just sort of brought to my attention. I, I just wonder, as I indicated before, this was an exceptional group. You don't find tenant associations writing letters in many instances to the local authorities, to the, to the regional offices, and to the, to the secretary of HUD. I mean, that's not a normal procedure. Many people really don't even know who the secretary of HUD would be at any particular time. With all of these things happening, I, I, it's just unconscionable to understand why there was no action on the part of the regional office. I could see if, because you have many housing authorities all around the country, and it's probably impossible, especially under the Reagan administration, he said we all will do more with less, you know, and there were cutbacks and things of this nature like monitoring and so forth. But in an instance, when there was so much communication, there was, there were, I've got, uh, news articles where, where the tenants picketed the executive director's office. Uh, how could this go unattended? It seemed like if they were going to do any, they might look into this Passaic Housing Authority. Do you have any, any answer for, for how this could simply uh, go along? It's not a, like I said, it's not a, a situation where the tenants were unorganized or voiceless. They, they were those things, but with no response. First of all, Mr. Payne, I have no knowledge of the letters. Uh, I can assure you if they were addressed to my office, there would have been some response to them in a timely manner. All right, but uh, where does it end when it goes to the sector? I could see if it went to the Newark office and there could be no response. You might not have known it, but if it goes up to the top, who do you write to get to you? I mean, it's the bottom and the top. They wrote to the Passaic Housing Authority, which is the local, they wrote to the national head who's in charge of the whole country, and now you say it didn't get to you. How does it get to you then? Through Britain and back or what? I mean, no, tell quite often people come directly to us, and you know, the hearings, for instance, have evoked tremendous volumes of mail, which we review each and every one of those complaints to determine what action is appropriate with respect to those, and we would have reacted to them. Would Mr. Pierce send it down to you, or? The there, there are occasions when the secretary and others, the principal staff, Mr. Keating or Mr. Janice, others who receive complaints, they think the matters that require our attention will send to us and ask us to look into them. Right, it's just my, my only concern, uh, don't want to be redundant, is that at what point uh, is there concern on the part of the federal government that evidently something may not be going right? It certainly evidently can't be activity from a local ha uh, tenant council. 
It certainly can't be letters written and responded to. And I simply wonder if this audit had not gone by with a quarter of a million dollar man, uh, maybe it would have been a half million dollars by next year if we hadn't caught him at this time. Or maybe by the year 2000 with inflation bumped up, it would be a million dollars. At what point would someone have taken the time and the attention to say there is an abuse? We've got a, 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 a cut back in housing from 32 billion down to eight, where we've got people that are homeless, where the whole question of our nation is the lack of a national housing policy, and we allow abuses like this to go into, I, I just, I can't understand. Of course, I'm a new member of Congress, and so I, maybe I just don't understand how the federal government works. And maybe that's the, my problem. Evidently, you don't see this as a problem, where maybe my coming in as a newcomer see it as a problem. When people write and you don't respond, that's a problem. I couldn't, couldn't agree more, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Payne. I would only comment that, uh, first of all, I think the, uh, the first line of monitoring is the New York office, as the chairman and uh, Mr. Lukens quite uh, appropriately pointed out, uh, and they've, there's a hierarchy there. Uh, there are some 3,100 public housing authorities in the country, approximately. All those are subject audits by independent public accountants, and we oversight those audits. We do only on an exception basis audits ourselves, the Inspector General's Office does, of public housing authorities. We don't have the capacity to audit each and every one of those. That's the reason the, the independent public accounts are employed to do those sort of things. Right, if there are th indications within their reports that require further attention by us, we go out and we do that additional work. Right, and, and, and I initially prefaced my remarks. I didn't know there were 3,100, but I, I know there are a lot. Yeah. And I, I know that you can't just investigate or look into everyone. But my point was that probably in New Jersey anyway, that this particular group, this particular town's tenant council, the persons who lived in public housing, probably generated more activity than, than any other place. So that's my point. It seemed that some initiative would be taken or some, someone would, would give some attention to that one since you can't do 3,100. That, that's exactly my point. I have no other question, Mr. Chairman. Please. Thank you very much. I want to just make sure that, that I'm clear because there was an assumption that this only happened in, I guess, say, 88. Uh, was he only paid for four jobs in 88? No, sir. I think we stated earlier, Mr. Uh, Shays, that it preceded in 1986, 87, and 88, and some of it was ongoing in 1989. Is that correct, Mr. Payne? Yeah. So, so and this possibly earlier. Yes, sir. So, I mean, this quarter of a million dollar man may be, in fact, a million dollar man, for all we know. <coughs> Congresswoman Rukema. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I don't know whether the first question I'm going to ask you, you're in a position to answer, but uh, naturally there's a lot of interest in um, the state of New Jersey as to which are the other housing authorities that are targeted, and I noted in your uh, statement on page 8, you uh, told how you came to select Passaic uh, after narrowing down a list for a, the routine CAP audit. Uh, is it safe to assume that there was evidence that you had in, in the other towns of Perth Amboy, Pensauken, and Patterson uh, that were under consideration? Is there any implication that we can draw with respect to the targets of the strike force? in New Jersey? Well, first of all, from that statement, the strike force is under the leadership of Mr. Schiff in the public housing and um, we're awaiting the outcome of that. So, uh, but I will address your earlier part of your question. Uh, the four cities that were mentioned in my statement were ones that we had looked at because of the kind of the level of funding, for instance, that went into them. It was nothing specifically to target. We are currently doing an audit of Perth Amboy. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, we a CAP audit? Or no, a more a, general uh, A more general uh, audit. And uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Kane corrects me, that is a CAP audit. It's a CAP audit. Yes, ma'am. All right. Uh, now, I share with the chairman the fact that some of these events are mind boggling. Um, but I am also now uh, even more concerned with what I think I understand from your testimony as to the actual legal and routine procedures or lack uh, thereof that are required uh, by PHAs in order to comply with HUD 
regulations, whether the chain of command lead to the area office, the regional office, or to Washington. So I want some, some clarification here. Are you suggesting, have you said that there is no certification beyond submitting a budget? Did I understand you correctly? That the PHA submits a budget to the area office and that's it? There is no meeting to discuss the merits of the budget. There is no um, oversight at that point or at another point. And beyond that, there are not required outside audits. I mean, yes. respond to your last question because, first. Because Each this year, is really a, a very, I mean, more troubling than the specific in, instance if this is general practice throughout the country. Let me respond to your last question first, if I might, Ms. Yes. Rukma, and then maybe I would like to defer to Mr. Uh, Janice and Mr. Keene with a more detailed response on the other part. Uh, each public housing authority is required to have annually an audit by an independent public accountant. And in this, ca in this case, the uh, auditor, as I understand it, has also been suspended. I mean, who? No. The, uh, the well, fee accountant not... has been suspended, not the auditor. The, oh, I... the public housing authorities uh, employ various yeah. accountants to well, do... Well, then tell me, uh, how could this have gone on if there was an annual audit and the auditor did not uncover it? Well, can you enlighten me there? The 1987 audit did carry a reference to the compensation question and suggested that further work be done, and that was part of the reason that we began to look at the Passaic situation. And to whom was that audit submitted? That is submitted uh, to the department through us. We review each and every one of the public housing authority uh, audits. To, by, uh, to, to you in Washington, to the regional office, to the area office, what is the chain of command? To our regional inspector general, Mr. Kane, and his staff review that and then send it forward to the New York field office. And, it, and it, it indicated that there was a question with respect to the numbers of people hired and who was collecting the salaries. I'll let Mr. Kane respond more yes, specifically. Yes, what did it indicate? The, uh, the report did indicate that there were certain problems with respect to extra compensation being paid. Also indicated some of the allocation of salaries were not correct, and there were several other findings which we did not uh, develop in our report. This audit was received, however, during the period of time uh, we were starting our own audit. Uh, I think, I believe in January of uh, 89, the report was received. So. We had made our determination uh, to some extent that we were going to go into a uh, Passaic uh, just about the same time the audit report came in. Uh, but it was for only one year. Can you account for the fact that they overlooked certain obvious uh, things such as the quadruple uh, compensation here uh, in the previous years? You the uncovered it Ra with relative ease, as I understand it, um, for a period of three years, and yet, although an audit, annual audit is required, we have only one, evi one year's evidence that there was any suspicions raised. I think in the year 1985, there was some reference to a, a problem along these lines, which was uh -huh. resolved. In 86, the audit report contained no findings and no reference to uh, problems. All right, well, again, let, excuse again, me, did. let me just ask you again now, if I, if I didn't hear the answer, excuse me, but uh, should the area office have picked that up or the regional office? Who should have picked it up the year, the first time the audit, auditor raised the red flag? I would have to say, you know, it's the auditor's <coughs> responsibility and he did indicate in the 1985 report yeah, but the, the, the auditor a files a report. With whom does he file the report, and who's responsible for reading the report and reacting? Okay, and the field office to has the responsibility of resolving any findings, and the findings were resolved based on correspondence and, and dialogue between the uh, field office and also the housing authority. What does that mean in plain English? Uh, uh, what does it mean it was resolved when we know that this man, these people were collecting these checks? Well, apparently it wasn't resolved satisfactorily, but it was, the field office was advised by the housing authority that these conditions did not exist, All right, so, and they re-resolved the finding. Uh, by the way, uh, I assume, is it the PHA that signs these checks? 
The checks to the executive director? Yes. Mm -hmm. And he never noticed, the PHAs uh, evidently never noticed that the same name appeared on four checks for four different positions. Well, the, the, the board, you know, the chairman and the vice chairman actually it. signed the checks. The board did approve uh, the executive director having these multiple positions. Uh, they were aware of it. Uh, it wasn't I, something that was, you know, the wool was pulled over the board's eyes and that, they were aware. But, but this is, in other words, it really should have been easily uncovered by any reputable audit and reported and the field office should have known about it. Is that correct? It did not take much digging or great genius to uncover these practices which were evidently common. Based on the extent that these practices did exist, I would have to say these uh, problems should have come out sooner, either by the IPA or I think the field office. Uh, but th they were not that easily detected. I mean, but because of the widespread nature of some of the problems we found, I think they should have been detected sooner. Now, you alluded to uh, no competitive bids in terms of legal services. Was there evidence of competitive bidding and in the range of other services as well, or not? I mean, absence of competitive bidding. With respect bidding. to the contracting activities, there was uh, ample uh, bidding practices, and we had no problem in that area. We had area. no problem with that. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, um, I, I guess I have just one final question. Uh, as you've heard, uh, Mr. Adams, I have requested a, a broadened scope to this uh, investigation. Uh, would you feel that your IG's office has the uh, resources to participate in expansion, or would you suggest a, uh, a specific uh, additional personnel and resources? Well, we requested some, some additional resources in this year's budget, and unfortunately, Graham Rudman uh, took those away from us. Uh, we are rather strained at the present time, but uh, we will reprioritize our work to, to accommodate whatever we can in the process. Are you uh, engaging in these kinds of routine audits throughout the country? No, ma'am. Presently? At, as I mentioned earlier, they are subject to annual audits by the independent public accountants, and we review those, and we are consulting with Mr. Uh, Janice and his group as they well, go through this to try to get a better focus. We are providing them with some counsel on how they might go about conducting their strike forces to identify those kind of issues, uh, and if we find need to, we will do additional audits. In but uh, but uh, PSAIC was singular and unique and the only CAP audit you did? No, we did, uh, lo I think the number is approximately in 35 other locations. All right. Uh, we're just about to, a new, uh, to issue, in fact, well, I we have issued a draft. That's the answer report. to my question. You, yeah. you, uh, you have expanded, and these are throughout the country? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Please. I want to be clear, this basically is just one program of the Housing Authority that you were looking at, and when you looked at it, then you uncovered other things that weren't related to this specific program. Yes, we broadened the scope of our audit as we move forward. So if he had not received compensation for this particular program, you might not have uncovered uh, this activity. Except it was mentioned in the 1987 Independent Public Accountants Report, there was a compensation mm -hmm. question also. So there was a slide flag. We had begun the it's not a audit. criticism of you. I'm just, no, I'm, I'm just, just trying, trying to, to think of how you know fortunate or unfortunate we were that you uncovered this in it. Um. I, I do believe the uh, the staff did an awfully good job and did take quite a bit of work to uncover the, the full scope of it. I don't believe, based on the knowledge we have at this point, that the compensation will ascend to the same level in the previous years it did in 1988. I think it was a growing problem there, and so it probably started on a much more modest scale. I, I could ask my, the next speaker, but I, I, I will ask you this as well, because I'd like your opinion. I, I'm almost reluctant to ask because I don't think I'm going to like your answer. But it seems to me the ten, tenor, tenor of, this, of your statement is that m much of what may have happened may not have been illegal, even though we all know it, was, uh, it really stinks. Um, this is an ongoing investigation. I would prefer not to comment on the legality of it at this time, Mr. Shays. Okay. Well, I'm got, then I'm, if that's going to be your comment, I want you then to just to make comment to your statement uh, that is also um, in, um, in the audit as well. You, you say, by approving the resolutions and allowing compensation to exceed the HUD-approved budget, the Board of Commissioners did not exercise proper oversight. 
uh, proper oversight isn't necessarily illegal. Um, and I guess what I'm saying, did you choose these words carefully or could you have used other words? I think they're uh, carefully chosen because we don't uh, impinge upon uh, the investigative process. And also we're in large part controlled by auditing standards on what we say in audit reports. Yeah. Well, it's just it's, um, I don't mean to beat a dead horse, but it's the part of the reason why sometimes I think Congress falls asleep when we read these reports, because um, if you had said, by approving the resolutions and allowing compensation to exceed the HUD-approved budget, the Board of Commissioners participated in a ripoff to the federal government, uh, I think that, that uh, you would have, uh, and, and, and it just makes me, you know, wonder about other reports that you do, uh, if, if in choosing your words so carefully, uh, you don't, in a sense, participate, uh, and I don't mean this unkindly, but participate in a cover-up of really activities that we should really know about. And uh, you were very generous, it seems to me, with your description of their activities to the, their benefit. The careful choice of the words are not to any way obscure the issues, only to comply with auditing standards yeah. because there's still unresolved issues involved in the thing, and those will be resolved yeah. through the investigative process, Mr. Chase. Thank you. I might ask the two of you gentlemen to remain at the table and I'd like to swear in the next two witnesses from HUD. Uh, Mr. Frank Keating, General Counsel of HUD and Mr. Michael Janis, General Deputy Assistant Secretary. If you gentlemen